I'm Rob Jones, and in these modules, I'm going to be teaching you the basics of working with live, as well as showing you various methods for composing, producing, and performing to give you the skills necessary to use the software in whatever way you want. I'm assuming you have a basic understanding of audio and MIDI, but I'm also aiming to help those who are completely new to music software. The way you approach the course is entirely up to you and dependent on how quickly you pick up the various techniques along the way. However, I personally recommend going through each module slowly, pausing them as you go to try things out in live. And then, at the end, practicing everything you've learned for a minimum of 40 minutes, following my suggestions and using the provided sessions, so that each module has at least an hour spent on it. That way, it's more likely that everything you've learned will sink in properly. Also, if you have any questions, then you can contact me on support at abletoncourses.com or go to the forum on the same website where you can discuss issues with other students and myself. This first module is a little bit different from the others though, in that I'm going to briefly go over some live concepts and introduce you to the main areas of the software. So you needn't necessarily practice too much after this module and can move straight on to the second one, where we'll be looking at how to play audio clips in session view. After you first boot it up live then, the first thing you need to do is to set up the preferences. This is essential when any audio application is first launched, so you can tell it where to send the audio to, where to get the audio from, what MIDI devices or controllers you might have connected, what sample rate to work at if this is something you need to do, most people are fine working at the default rates, and even what the software looks like. So let's get started. The preferences are found in the live menu here or you can call them up using the keyboard shortcut Apple comma or control comma on a PC. It's a good idea to learn a few of the keyboard shortcuts to make using the software quicker. In particular, I tend to use a lot of the edit shortcuts such as copy, paste, split, consolidate and quantize. You'll find out what each of these does in live later on in the course. So in the preferences then, there are a number of tabs to choose from down the left side. Let's start with audio. In the top section here you can see all the options for setting up your sound card or audio interface. If you don't have an audio interface then it's likely that your computer has some kind of built-in sound and you can just select built-in output in the audio output section here and connect some headphones or use the built-in speaker to hear sound from live. If you have an audio interface though, once the interface has been installed and is connected it will show up in this list and you can just select that option to send sound from live to the interface. If you have multiple outputs on the interface, then Live will normally select the first two, commonly used as the master output on most interfaces, so you can connect those outputs to your speakers to get going. If you want to record sound using a connected interface, then you can select it in the input section here. But we'll go into that more later on in the course. If you're dealing with digital audio streams or synchronization, I'm guessing you won't be, then this is where you can select an appropriate sample rate. The default rate is 48 kHz, which I've always found totally acceptable both on my ears and my hard drive. You could lower this to 44.1 kHz if you want though, which is the sample rate that regular audio CDs use. This would save you a little hard disk space without making much of a difference to the sound. The section below allows you to set a buffer rate. Now although this is another pretty complex setting to get your head round, it may be important later on in your studio work, especially as you start to introduce more external equipment like firewire devices into your setup. The buffer setting basically defines how much latency your system has. Latency is a term you'll become accustomed to as you go. It's another word for delay, in this case caused by your computer processing the audio. This probably isn't something you need to change, as most computers are nice and powerful these days. However, it might be something you need to look at at some stage if problems arise. So there it is. The next one we're going to look at is the MIDI tab. Here you can set up any connected MIDI interfaces or controllers. If you don't know what MIDI is, then don't fear as we'll look into this more in the modules later on. A MIDI device is something that sends and receives MIDI data, which is a language of digital music, so that you can, for example, control the live mixer or instruments, or control your plugins, or use live to play sound on a hardware synth. The setup of MIDI devices is frequently different from the setup of audio interfaces, in that, on a Mac at least, you generally need to have MIDI devices connected before the software boots up, whereas audio interfaces can often be disconnected and reconnected while the software is running, 
and then just reselect it in the preferences. Any connected MIDI devices should show up in the bottom section here, with all available ports shown one after the other. To set up a particular port for remote MIDI controlling, you need to turn on the remote switches on the ports row here. So if I want to use the knobs on my Innovation X station I have connected to control the software, I need to set the input remote setting to on. But if I only want to play instruments with the keys, then I only need to activate track and can leave remote off. Activating multiple controllers here is totally fine though, as live will just merge any incoming data. Lastly, in the preferences, there's the look and feel tab. Here you can change the skin of the software, which sets the color. I personally like dark gray if I'm wanting to chill it out, or frost if I'm needing to wake up. Now let's have a look at the main areas of the software, how they work and how they relate to one another. There are two view modes, session view and arrangement view. Session view is generally the place you start in as it's the area for creating ideas, building up loops, as well as the main area for performing or DJing. In this view, audio loops or whole tracks can be played together and either triggered just once or made to loop continuously. Each piece of audio is called a clip and these are the building blocks of live. Clips are placed into slots anywhere on the grid, but only one clip can be played in each vertical column at a time, as the vertical columns represent tracks. However, you can have as many tracks as you like, as well as an unlimited number of horizontal rows, which are called scenes. As well as audio tracks, it's possible to add MIDI tracks, which are very similar, only the clips contain MIDI data, which is used to play live's internal instruments or external plug-in instruments. The other view is called Arrangement View, and this is where clips are laid out along a timeline, much like the format used for all other digital audio workstations, as it echoes multi-track tape recording. In this view, the tracks lie horizontally, and hitting play makes the song position move along the timeline, playing all clips that are laid out below. Consequently, this is the area used to lay out and produce your track. You alternate between these views using the switches in the top right corner, or by pressing the tab key on the computer keyboard. It's important to realize, however, that changing views does not alter what you are hearing. Although the mixer tracks in both views are the same, only one clip can play at a time throughout, and won't switch to another clip or arrangement of clips unless specifically instructed to do so, either by launching a different clip in the session view, or by clicking the Back to Arrangement switch on the control bar. You can edit any track's mixer controls on either page, though, as in change a track's volume or panning, as well as muting and soloing, because the mixer controls are universal throughout live. In both views, there are switches to turn on and off the various displays. On the right side, you have the mixer switches, which mean you can have as much or as little of the mixer displayed as you need. This means you can conserve valuable screen space on the arrangement page, but have all of the mixer controls shown in session view. The switches in either corner allow the view of additional sections used for various other purposes in live. Firstly, you have info view in the bottom left corner here. This is a really handy feature that provides information for anything the mouse cursor is resting over. You can even edit this yourself for various parts of the software to make your sessions ultra organized. Along the left side, you have the browser. This is an area that allows you to select audio or MIDI clips, plugins, or Live's internal instruments and effects to use in your session. And down at the bottom, you have an area that displays either the currently selected clip information or the device chain for a track. Of course, most of these sections can be resized to make the screen layout work for you. Along the top of the screen, you have what's called the control bar, which contains many of the global controls for your session. Firstly, on the left, you have the tempo and time signature settings. Tempo is the speed that your session is running at, and is measured in beats per minute. Time signature is a little more complex. This is how many beats are in each bar. The standard default setting is four crotchets per bar. This is the normal time signature you'll find in pop music today, where each beat represents the kick drum in a house music track, for example. 